monitor on the touch bar. And so you can tap to start uh, mirroring or unmirroring and things like that. Boy, that is really useful. Because I have one client who wants me to do these things remotely, and so I have to get my screen interface shared. And then the touch bar becomes my really good friend. And it's complete and cross check. Copy that. Healy, I just want to say thank you for answering the million dollar question yesterday when it was asked, is there any way to like pin or your channels? channels? Oh my goodness. <laughs> I know. I forgot, I forgot who asked it, but every time I'm like, oh, I got to ask Healy. Oh, I got to figure. There has to be a way. People are not, people's Discord do, does not look the way mine does. And um, you answered it. So I no longer will. But then the hack that you said of like whatever the last channel you went to, that mm -hmm. it will. So thank you. Command K, <laughs> you're welcome. It's, it's a feature request that many people have put in because it's something that they're familiar with, a feature that you can use in Slack and various other apps like that. And it's funny because server owners then come back with, um, I put that in a specific category for a specific reason and y'all can live with it. Like there's this little power struggle between users and server owners. But I mean, to me, it's an indication if I had people in my uh, in my servers who were often requesting that kind of ability, I would take that as feedback that I need to reorganize my channels because the most important things to many people are not where they expect them to be. So it's sometimes there's, and what was the term wetware, you know, instead of looking for a software solution, we can look for a wetware solution and just design it a little better for the people. But there you go. I like how your brain does that. We've been in a couple of sessions where it's like you hear the feedback, like, well, this is what it's really telling me is going on. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I'm regularly told that everything wrong with Discord is my fault. So I spend a lot of time thinking about how well, I that's can... a truism. There, there <laughs> has to be somebody's fault and you're yeah. fabulous. So there you yeah. go. <laughs> your we need burden. a ref for a scapegoat. Yes, yeah. exactly. So it might as well be yours. <laughs> And a quick reminder to all panelists to look into, look through the questions. So please raise your hand as early as possible because that helps the back end team. And it kind of helps me too. Just kind of. Greetings and welcome to Office Hours. If you are new here and you want to learn a little bit more about what we do, head over to officehours.global. 
Our first hour, we answer your questions on media and digital production. And our second hour is something that we typically want to spend a little bit more time on. And with the rise of AI and ChatGPT and all of these resources, we want to talk about how you can use them in practical ways for your business. So stay tuned for our second hour. Producers, go ahead and get your questions in early. And speaking of questions, Bill, let's head into the show. Absolutely. Our first one comes from Serge Blondin in Montreal, Canada. And Serge says, what is the panel recommendation for a good computer chair going to be in use 10 plus hours a day? Budget is less than 500 US dollars, but still to put more cry once, buy once is an option, I guess. Go ahead, Bill. So uh, chairs are a topic that we revisit regularly here. And I know chairs can seem to be, at least at the top end, extraordinarily expensive. I think I spent well over $1,000 on the one that I'm sitting in. But I've got to tell you, I don't feel bad about that at all. That was about 25 years ago. And I'm still sitting in it today. And it is still unbelievably comfortable over 10 hours. Most of the time, those high-end office chairs get up into that kind of thing. But I will say that right now, there have been so much instability in businesses that you can often Often look around on the Craigslist type of sites and find a lot of businesses who are downsizing after the pandemic and kicking out these really high-end office chairs at really good prices. Uh, the two that come to my mind, I am in a steel case leap, which is one of kind of those premium chairs. Um, oh, and I was going to space on the other one. Somebody will mention it. Everybody knows them. They've been around forever. Uh, those two, if you can survive not going new but can buy in the used market will give you years of good service and all of the parts and the office supply uh, infrastructure out there to order parts is in almost every city around. So look at the high end and see if you can find use. Go ahead, John. Yeah, Bill nailed it. Um, I like the Herman Miller Aeron chair. If you're if you're weird like Chris uh, Fenwick, you have the Mira chair, but uh, they're on Mar Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist. And right within your budget there, I've I've bought in dozens and dozens of chairs off of the used marketplace from the three hundred fifty to six hundred dollar range. And Alex, yeah, the Her Herman Miller kind of. I'm on Herman Miller. A lot of us are on Herman Miller's. Uh, I'm on the Mira, uh, the the Chris that Chris uses. Um, and uh, I've but I've had the Aeron for years as well before that. Um, and so I uh, both of those have been just incredible chairs. But Herman Miller kind of runs this the, this uh, this this world, um, and people have new ones or used ones, but they have lots of them. Uh, you see them everywhere for good reason. They you, you, they tend to last a long time, and uh, they tend to really do all the things they need to do. One that I'm looking at, um, I, I'm looking to get in another chair for another location in the house, is but I'm looking at experimenting because I you know I've had Herman Miller for so long. Is the autonomous Ergo Chair Plus, which is about four hundred dollars, and um, it looks like they just uh, it looks like they just built a Mira <laughs> so for four hundred dollars. And so I, I'm very curious, and I need another one. So I thought maybe I'd give that a shot. So um, that, so that's another one that you might want to look at as well. Go ahead, Chris. So Alex, I'm curious. Uh, I remember it was like two and a half years ago. You said, "What would people rec recommend for a chair?" And uh, I mentioned the Mira. Having experience with the Aeron, why were you, you were just out of curiosity, wanted to try something different? It's because you recommended it. And, and I was just like, oh, Chris likes it, and I'll give it, I've already had <laughs> you the, did I, say. I think you did say, well, Chris is pretty picky. It's probably pretty good. Yeah, I, I, I respect other people's pickiness. And so I just go, oh, Chris is picky. And, and, and I, you know, I'm, I'm definitely like, I just got a new, new set. Of, you got to understand what the, my personality is that I got to, I'll, tend to lean towards let's do something new before let's do buy the same thing I've done before. Like I walked huh. into a store yesterday and I bought some berries that are horrible, but I I, I bought them because I didn't know what they were. <laughs> so, yeah. so I was like, well, they're at the store. I'll give them a shot. It was a bad idea. And, and for the record, this one was the, good idea. the primary difference between the Aeron and the Mira is that the Mira is infinitely adjustable, whereas the Aeron, you have to purchase the right chair for your body size, your body type, mm -hmm. uh, not type, but just if you're, if you're a little tiny person, you need a, uh, 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 an air on a, if you're a, a bigger, more substantially fed person, <laughs> you might need the, uh, air on C, but, um, and, and you just Mira, mean that it has a lot of adjustments. You said infinitely adjustable. You it's infinitely just... adjustable. So, so like, so like in, uh, literally th there is a weight limit on the air on a, and if you're too heavy for it, 
it's not good for it. Whereas the, the springs on the mirror, you can tighten it down to the point where, you know, I can almost fall over backwards when I do the recline, or I can tighten it up or completely lock it. Also, the uh, mirror, I don't, do, do you remember when I sent you this picture, Alex? Uh, the mirror has a control on the front of your arm, yeah, the, the your little, thighs, the, the, where you can roll down the front of the chair if you, if it supports your your thigh too much. And I sent him that, I sent Alex this picture. I go, by the way, don't forget this this control. And he was like, oh my goodness, I was totally going to ask you about that. Because <laughs> the funny thing is, is that I have a- It's hard to see the control. I controller. have a pet peeve. I have a pet peeve with, uh, yeah, um, a, a, with that that specific thing. And it and uh, yeah, it's 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 very adjustable. I don't have to admit, I have a little pad that sits on top of that. And then I have a thing that goes under my feet so that my legs are up. You know, like I have a lot of things that make it because I'm, I'm on this chair a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I, I definitely have it kind of customized to make it work. And it was, I will say that whatever you get, it's worth it because, you know, especially if you spend a lot of time on it, it yeah. makes a huge difference. Alexander? Well, I have a $200 Ikea chair that I really like. I don't spend 10 hours a day on it, but I can do a four hour video editing session. It's perfectly comfortable. I've looked at the pronunciation. It, apparently it's pr pronounced Langfjell. Or Langfie? I'm not sure. Anyways, I'll put a link here. <laughs> yeah. And Bill. Just one last comment about the adjustability. Everybody who I've ever talked to in ergonomics, which is the science of making sure that you're well supported in the process of working, um, says that these tiny adjustments like the arm pads, whether they're up uh, a half an inch or not, all comes down to keeping you in a position where your feet are flat on the floor, your thighs are not either pressing down or above the chair so that they're perfectly supported. The back has the right tension and everything else. And once you achieve all this through all these adjustments, then your body literally has to expend far less energy while you're just sitting at your desk. And that makes a difference over 10 hours plus. So adjustability is one of the big deals with these chairs. And Alex? And put it into second hours if you want. I think that it's pr there's probably an argument for us to do a second hour on ergonomics, you know, like on a Monday or something, just because it would it would make sense to talk about chairs and arms. A lot of us spend a lot of time on it. I think it would be a good Monday session. So if you're interested as in that. As soon as you said the the foot pad and the arms, like, wait a minute. Yeah, I got a I whole little, like, <laughs> some, of us, some of us have a lot, of, a lot of moving parts here. Um, and yeah, so I would do that. And by the way, I don't know why, the, the, when Alexander brought, brought up the, uh, the the Kia thing, I will say that if you haven't seen Deadpool, the, the, the discussion about Ikea furniture in Deadpool is, the best part of the whole movie. I mean, there's a lot of good action scenes, but the discussion about the dead, about Ikea furniture was the best. Next question. Next one comes to us from David Brady in New York City. And David says, have a new Win 10 Zoom Room install. And it's running on an Intel NUC Core i5 and trying to use NDI webcam on it. Shortly after it launches, it automatically closes from the taskbar. Where can my troubleshooting begin? Alex? Yeah, uh, we did a little research on this this morning. Uh, the recommendation is is to look at um, making sure that you absolutely have the newest version of NDI webcam as well as Zoom rooms. It, it probably is NDI tools, but what the best way to kind of sort that out would be to, of course, uh, open up your Windows event viewer and try to see what, what operations are happening. And then if it continues to happen with the new versions and you have the event viewer, then open a ticket with Zoom and see if you can't uh, get to the bottom of it. Next question. Next question comes from Guy Cochran in Seattle, Washington, and he says, Time Magazine cover, it's on quantum computers. Will this change our industry? And he has the link there so you can see for yourself. Go ahead, John. Not anytime soon. The quantum quantum computers will be great for large tasks. Uh, what matters to us is the encoding and decoding side, and that, that stuff's built into ASICs. That's when it makes a monumental change in, in video compression, decompression. That's not going to happen in, in quantum computing. You need giant amount of power in order to get those things to work. But they'll be great for encryption in, in the future. I think Alex has some more words. Alex? Yeah, they may or may not be used, being used now. <laughs> so the quantum, quantum, quantum computers may, may you know, they're not used in a, in a, in a more broad spectrum. Uh, the, the main thing that quantum, a lot of people want to know what quantum uh, computers do or what makes them different. And from my understanding, limited understanding of quantum, of, uh, quantum uh, computers is that instead of having bits, which are on and off, you have qubits, which are 
both on and off and can, can be on and off at any degree. And what that means is that as you start to build entanglements, that's what they call them, entanglements between qubits, um, it allows them to be in different states um, based on the other qub- other ones that they're entangled with. Um, because of that, they, as you add more of those to that, enta- as you entangle more of these qubits together, what ends up happening is, is that they're all moving based on each other. Um, and that exponentially increases the speed at which it can work on, it can work out um, uh, processes. Many things are happening in parallel and many interrelationships. There's a lot of things that are very hard to do in parallel in the standard computing that we have right now where bits are on and off and not really related to each other. But as we have all of these bits relating to each other and having vari- various variable set um, states that they can be in all at the same time, uh, it allows them to very, very quickly taking things that might take might have taken a thousand years and reduce it down to a couple hours. <laughs> so, so it, for people who are um, encrypt, the biggest problem we really get into, the biggest danger of them, uh, is probably around encryption and, and and so on and so forth. Because what's happening right now is you look at the LastPass break in. The problem isn't that LastPass. Uh, can get in, the, the people who broke into LastPass can get into those passwords right now. They're saving them all. They're literally just ho- hoovering all that data up with that's fully encrypted um, with the belief that at some point in the future, they can actually just go in there and unencrypt everything. You know, it's the same thing that the governments are doing. They'll, they'll hoover a bunch of stuff that's all encrypted, knowing that there's some day that that might get unlocked. You know, and um, and so that you know things that that seem impenetrable will become suddenly transparent, and that is a that's going to change a lot of things. And so a lot of people are working pretty hard at it. From our perspective, I mean, when you look at AI, which we're going to talk about in the second half of the hour, um, what it can do. If you think about the delays or the or, or what it's or the even the detail, the reason we get these little two K by two K images because it takes so long to compute. If suddenly you were able to compute these, you could theoretically you know, build 16K by 16K in an instant, you know, of, you know, from the AI queries that we're, we're, we're doing. So uh, a lot of things could happen very fast at, and it could accelerate a lot of things and probably do as much damage. Oh, it'll do less damage than, than good, but it will still do damage. <laughs> so we just have to know that, but it, it'll, it'll probably produce more good than, than bad, but we have to understand that it's not going to all be good. Next question. Next one comes to us from Douglas Carmichael, and he says, has anyone used ProPresenter outside of the church world? I've heard a lot about it, but never used it. Bill? Yeah, I I actually have a few times. Uh, Back in the early days, it was used mostly in worship service stuff, but it does some things really, really well, including uh, time organization and bringing in of external things. So if you want to play cues back, the kind of thing you would do during a church service, if you wanted to cue a multimedia or a piece of music or something like that, it's designed for that. And it's pretty robust, been used for a long time. Uh, I haven't used it since those early days when I experimented with it, but when I did it was um, it was pretty solid for the corporate world too, and I think there are a lot of people out there who use it every day. It's a pretty robust program. Alex, yeah, we used it for a while because it was the only relatively inexpensive software that would do key fill output from a Mac for quite some time, and so a lot of us used it for that. I think that as more apps like a lot of apps started producing the key fill outputs. Uh, we kind of moved more to, towards ones that probably had a little less. The problem really is it's so built for house of worship that if you're not doing that, you kind of feel like you're using, you know, one one wheel of the car, uh, you know, and you have this big app that does all these things and you're only, you only need this little piece of it. So I don't know a lot of people that use them in event events because usually as we build those events, they're much more modular. What the Pro Presenter does really well for house of worship is it has all the things that you need to run it, you know, so everything from what goes up on the screens to the playback to all the things that you need there and so I would I would say that probably while they have tried to move out of that market uh, the house of worship market is probably 90 95 percent of their market right now and um, but it's a very very powerful app and really you know has evolved and just reacted with the market that it actually had and it serves it really well next question John Foldson, Ceilings Grove, Pennsylvania. Up next, news on audio hijack remote control. The new version, he notes, 4.0, supports simple API scripts. It works great with Apple scripts and is triggered easily from a stream direct, a steam, stream deck. Sorry about that. Uh, he says, thanks for the help. It's very powerful, he notes. Alex? I'm glad that I'm glad that it does have that API support. It is a it's a really powerful app. I, I think, you know, a lot of us have 
loop back and, and hijack, I would recommend if you ever look at these and you're hearing us talk about it, buy both of them at the same time because you use them together all the time and it just saves you some money. And and every that is a serious case of buy once, cry once, because every time I buy, I've bought loop back or hijack by itself. I ended up buying the other one within a couple of weeks and just felt silly. Next question. Alexander Knight in Vancouver, BC, here on the panel. What do you what do we think of the new Super 35 Studio 4K Blackmagic cameras? They look like a really solid update for studio use. Has anyone ordered one yet? Jason? No, I haven't ordered them yet, but I've got to say, having owned both of the other two, meaning, you know, the the 4K Pro and the 4K um, from the last generation, um, my only complaint about them is it like the micro four thirds problem and they completely got rid of that so yes if i i think that they're they're an excellent upgrade next question zach phillips in philadelphia pennsylvania says can you compare the stability and performance of mimo live to vmix for a remote studio alex i don't think stability is really the issue i think that both of them are are, are stable you know very stable apps I think that it's really a matter of feature sets um, and what you're looking for, and specifically interface. Uh, VMix is going to be is going to feel uh, much more like a standard control system that you're that you're used to using, while Memo is going to be a um, a little bit more of a. It's got its own way of doing things, <laughs> and so so there are certain creature comforts like a preview bus that you don't get in Memo because it's really built around automation. It's really built around building systems for one person to run with with a handful of things. And vMix um, has a little bit more of those creature comforts. I think it gets a little more complex than Memo when it comes to building out certain pieces. Um, I, I will admit that I have more experience with Memo Live than than with uh, vMix, which I have played with. I mean, we I did some pretty, in the early days of COVID, I did a pretty heavy push on vMix. And um, and I think it's a very powerful app. I, if I was going to do something on, the, on Windows, I think it usually comes down to platform. If I was going to do something on Windows, I would absolutely use vMix. And if I was doing something on Mac, I would use Memo Live. <laughs> so, so it's, but they're not because they don't compete on the same platform. I, but I don't think that stability is your problem. Next question. Alexander Knight in Vancouver, British Columbia is back again with, is anyone running dual ATEMs for redundancy in their mobile production workflow? Is there a failover box that you can insert into the middle that could detect no video signal and switch automatically to your backup? Jason? So maybe I'm paranoid, but I, I don't ever want my failover to be automatic. In fact, I want it to be insanely manual. So um, I, I have a set of pins that if I pull, those pins completely shut everything else off. And then I have to um, basically manually um, repatch it. So I, I would assume Alex is using something a little bit similar. But yeah, I, I've never done it automatically. And Alexander probably should have asked you first to, if there was something more you wanted to add context-wise to help with the question. Well, I was just thinking of uh, in the broadcast world with audio, you know, we have these silence detector boxes where they, um, you know, they will automatically fail over to something if there's an issue there for a live stream. So I was just, was just curious if there anything existed like that in the video broadcast world. Alex. Yeah, usually we do it manually uh, for the reasons that Jason outlined. Um, there are some, we have some um, boxes, and I just can't think of the name of them right now, but we have some boxes that will sit there and they'll basically watch to see if the video degrades or not. And if it happens for more than a second, it just switches to the other feed. It's not jumping from one switcher to the other. It's You're giving it two feeds at the same time. And it and it sits there and just processes them. And one degrades for more than, a, again, about more than a second or two. And sometimes you can set it as little as a couple frames. The problem you get into is it switch back and forth. <laughs> like it goes back and forth between the two. So if you're not feeding it exactly the same, at the same latency, you see it do this weird jump. And it does exactly why Jason says you don't want to do that is because it gets into this auto thing where it's going back and forth. And we've had a handful of times where, for instance, we had fiber coming in as the primary satellite coming in 1600 milliseconds behind the, that, you know, as, as the backup. And it's doing this weird jumping back and forth because it didn't like either signal. And it was had to do with the source, what the source was going into both of those. And so those are the kind of things you have to be careful of with those in the truck or in somewhere else with ATEMs. Um, typically what we do is we run into a router. So that router, and usually there's a, there's a fast, there's a macro that we can hit that's gonna switch you from one switcher to the other. And it can be done very quickly, but usually we make that decision, you know, ma as a manual process as opposed to an automated. We're one step away from we could say if it doesn't meet these criteria, switch over to the other one um, without too much trouble. But we don't we don't do that usually. 
Next question. Zach Phillips in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania has this scenario. You don't have Netgear 4250s. You've got managed TP-Link switches. You need to work with a maximum of four NDI sources and four channels of Dante Audio. What do you do to make sure this network is stable? Go ahead, Seth. But that's a relatively uh, little amount of traffic. It probably could actually coexist on one network. Uh, certainly, you don't need QoS or IGMP functions. Uh, nevertheless, I do like to segment NDI and Dante traffic on two different VLANs. Quite possibly, the most important thing is to check for a triple E energy efficient Ethernet and turn that off. Uh, that could be detrimental to both uh, NDI and Dante traffic. And Jason? Yeah, Seth pretty much nailed it. Um, I would make sure if you've got managed switches that you're on completely separate subnets that don't know about each other at all. Um, one side for NDI and one side for Dante. Next question. Uh, Tony Mobley with his conversations with Tony Mobley. says, panelists on yesterday, he was doing a house of worship recording on Zoom and he noticed that there were a lot more resources for the recording available to him. Is this something new with Zoom recordings? Alex? Oh, I, and I think I think I thought he said that there were more resources. It was using up more resources in the computer. If that's the case, it could be recording locally. If there's more resources to do the recordings, that's probably some kind of upgrade that most of us haven't seen. Because a lot of us, because we have Zoom ISO and because we have a lot of other things, we don't use Zoom's built-in um, recorders very often. I, just, I don't know if anyone knows of any other things that have been added to that uh, recording process. I know that they've talked in the past about adding things like uh, and, you know, and, you know, double end recording and other things like that. So it'll be interesting to see what, what happens there. And Tony, if you're still watching, feel free to add in the chat just some of the resources that you saw. And we'll be happy to check that out. Next question. Jack Rupel in uh, Breckenridge, Colorado, uh, says, who will currently stream Atmos content? And he wants theater grade, uh, 912-712-7151, a lot of different speaker arrangements. He's trying to set up a workflow for content creation and audio, and he notes audio can be more important than video. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, so the, there's... Um, I, I have some experience in doing Atmos uh, uh, streaming, and it's pretty hard um, to stream it live. Here, the problem really is dealing with the metadata. So, what what really happens when you're streaming out Atmos is that you theoretically have, I, I believe it's 120 objects or so, 120, 128 objects that you can move around. So, you have these little objects. You have they can be individual sounds. You have beds as well. So, you can have a handful of beds. That are out there that are just going into the channels uh, directly and then you have these objects that you can animate and all of that has metadata that tells you where those objects are get over time and that's all moving it's got to be moving over time and so it's got to tell you where they're all going and what they're all doing and um, carrying that metadata through your production pipeline and then carrying it into a stream is very hard so currently when you see a, an atmos stream it identifies as atmos if it's a live stream, now you, if you're if it's a VOD, you can absolutely do it, and it, and it oftentimes has that metadata. Uh, but what it does when you're streaming it is typically you're packaging it into a five one four seven one two nine one six, you know those those types of um, or possibly seven one four. But those you you take it into those formats that you have there, and you run the channels in. Then you run it into an encoder, an AWS, for instance, inside of their elemental encoding will actually take those channels and re-embed them and identify them as Atmos. So that if you have a system that does that, it'll identify them as Atmos and play them out. The real challenge you get into inside of that process is defining what that in the, there's a thing called a manifest that you have to put together um, that tells the, the player what it's going to get. Um, this manifest and this process is very easy on iOS and Mac OS and tvOS devices. <laughs> it works perfectly. Uh, Apple has been doing this for over five years. I think is they're close to seven or six or seven years now. And you just turn it on and it just works. Uh, on the Android and Windows platform, it does not. <laughs> and so uh, it, it becomes extremely painful um, to stream at most to uh, Android and Windows because they um, they've tried to kind of work around. They're trying not to spend money on the licenses. Apple just said, we'll just buy all the licenses. And they said that a long time ago. And so because of that, it just works, um, as, as Apple would say. And uh, Windows, they, you know, the user has to pay a dollar to get a thing. And, you know, it's just, and so what happens is, is that it's just a, it's a hodgepodge of, of fragmented markets or, or, or targets 
that you have out there. Some of these companies that do anything that is remotely interesting have literally built hundreds of manifests for a given show. And they do what they call dynamic manifesting, which is that you have to actually, the player asks for something and the system builds the manifest for that player, knowing what device it's on, um, because it's the only way to get it to actually work. So it's a really painful, it's really painful to do it as a wide open process, really easy to do it on, on the Apple devices and really hard to do it everywhere else. You can just use channels and not use Atmos. Um, and 5.1, we're experimenting with 5.1 on this show, not, not today, but we are experimenting with 5.1 um, and getting that out. Right now it only works with a, a, over the top um, set, you know, OTT, so Apple devices and some of the Android devices will do that. This is a 5.1 mix, um, and then it folds back down to stereo if you don't have those things. Um, but it's all coming, and we're going to be doing a lot of experimentation. I do agree with you that it's at least as important as the video. And uh, we're going to be using Office Hours as a lab to do this in the, in the next couple, in the coming weeks and months. Next question. Next one comes to us from Paul Tallery Wallace in Austin, Texas. What did you think of the Charlie Rose on PBS show format and style of interviewing? And who are the greatest interviewers or questioners past and present? Go ahead, John. I've not watched a lot of Charlie Rose myself, but I think our greatest interview currently is Kara Swisher. And she understands the subject matter enough to have a meaningful conversation with her subjects. She does a great job of making them feel safe and she's playful in her interviews and she doesn't let them get away with um, disregarding her questions. She's like a pit bull like, and people are open up to her about all sorts of really uh, sensitive or in-depth things. So I think she does a great job. Alex. Um, I think that I, I was a big fan. I, I spent a long, many, many, many hours watching Charlie Rose. I was really bummed that his, personal life was so complicated um, because his, professionally his ability to do interviews was was really um, outstanding. I think that uh, I think that also the other ones that I really like watching the interviews and I don't actually like watching most interviews um, very much. Um, but I like, um, you know, Tara Gross was, is, is very good on Fresh Air. She's really a function though of a post, a solid post-production process. Um, because, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the, because she's got a lot of producers that are helping her and then they edit it down. Um, the best live interviewer that I've worked with, uh, and I, that I know is actually Michael Krasny, who we use for our shows. Um, you know, where we work with his, on his show <laughs> and, uh, his ability to interview live. Remember we watch, we watch a lot of these, uh, in post after they've been edited down. Very little of what Michael does is edited down because he did it live you know, for 20, almost 30 years. And so uh, I find that his, I'm always amazed. We work with him every week and, and I'm always amazed that he, he sits down and just the amount that he digs into um, what he asks and how he, you know, very, very smoothly moves from one thing to the other is something I'm still trying to learn from. And then the other person that I would say that I enjoy listening to interviews is Leo Laporte. Um, you know, I think that he he's really good at asking those things and really good at creating a kind of a, a safe space uh, for people to talk. Go ahead, Bill. The one that I admire the most and the one they go back and look at more than anybody else is Barbara Walters, only because she came out of a thing where they had pigeonholed her into a set of questions and a type of interview. And she magnificently managed to break herself out of that, became a hard news interviewer, but never lost the human touch. So she was able to both engage with anybody on the other side of the interview, but also when it was necessary to ask tough questions did that unapologetically to reveal information for the audience. So she's one of my heroes in interviewing. And Alexander. Yeah, no particular order. I think Mark Marin is a, a very good interviewer on his podcast. I like um, Howard Stern as well, and also a big fan of Leo Laporte as well. Next question. Alexander Knight, Vancouver, British Columbia. When I switched from a first-gen Apple 4K TV to a second-gen, I noticed that switching between HDR, Dolby Vision, and SDR was much faster. Has anyone noticed image improvement on the latest version? Go ahead, Jason. Uh, I need a little bit of clarification here. Though so there have been three 4K Apple TVs so far, right? Are you talking about from the first time that Apple TV did 4K um, to the second one, or are you talking about the most recent one to the second most recent one? Yeah, ahead, so I'm talking about, yeah. yeah, I'm talking about the going from the first gen 4K to the second gen. I did notice an improvement. It also fixed some weird 
Dolby, at least on the TV, the Vizio TV that I had, some weird things with that that only seem to happen in Dolby Vision. So I'm just curious, on the latest box, are there actual further image improvements or faster speeds gotcha. when switching between? Gotcha. Okay. Um, so in my experience, it's there really isn't much of a difference other than the chipset seems to be able to to almost simultaneously maintain 30 and 60. Like for some reason, if if there's any glitch whatsoever, it will backhaul and kind of fail over in a way that is, I can't tell you if it's faster between the first to the second or the second to the third, but but it, it just, they keep just tightening it ever so slightly and it just keeps getting a little bit better. And Alex? Yeah, it's, they've all been slow for me because I forced them to, um, not to not to guess, but to, I force them to the frame rate. And because of that, what it does is it switches from 30 when it's 30 or 60 when it's in, uh, when you're in interface mode and back to 24 every time it goes to a 24 frame. And there's always like a five, you know, you're waiting for the segment to come in. So there's always like a five or six second wait for that to happen where you can hear the audio, but you can't hear the video, you can't see the video. So, and I do that with, that's just because I, I wanna see it at the frame rate it was created at, as opposed to guessing um, what that is. There should not be any difference in the quality of the Dolby Vision. Uh, I'd really love to see if you can try to quantify that um, by switching back and forth between them, looking at exactly the same content, because the way that Dolby Vision works and the way that a lot of the stuff works is that it's there's frames that are coming to it. The only reason would be is that it's saying from a processor perspective that it can't handle the higher bit rate from one do one part of the ladder from a, to another. So it can say, oh, I can't handle the 10, the, the 10 megs a second, just give me the eight. Um, and if it's on ethernet, the, the, the Apple TVs are so overbuilt for what they do that there should, even in the first generation, that they have so much, head, they have like 70, 80% headroom. <laughs> like there's just, um, that there should be no reason why they can't play whatever your bandwidth is allowing them to play um, out of that system. So it, it would be very, I'd love to hear more I have them. I can try to test it too. I have like, I think I have every version sitting somewhere in my house. Um, so I can go back and look at them, but I don't, I would be really surprised if there was a, a significant, I could, it might switch back and forth faster, but I'd be really surprised if there was a quality difference in the video. And Alexander? Yeah, Alex, are you talking about the the match content and frame rate setting? Because that's what I use too. And I just, to me, it was actually the, I was hesitant to upgrade the Apple TV, but it was absolutely worth it just for switching, like when it would switch and match frame rates, it was so much faster on huh. the second gen 4K TV box for me that it was worth that upgrade. I have the second gen, I don't have the, la I don't have the latest one. I have the latest one, here's the thing, I'm trying to update some of the apps because, it, because, they, because I couldn't register them in Apple. This is actually why I'm so against uh, opening up the app store is actually because of the Apple TV is that I had a bunch of them and I, I started going around in circles trying to figure out how to register some of my apps back into it, you know, again with the little controller and all the other things and I had to go to my web page and I had to do all this other stuff. And because of that, I just, it's still sitting on a box because I was like, oh, I don't have time for this. <laughs> you know, like I'm just, and, um, and so uh, I'm, that's, so the reason that I'm not using it, the newest Apple TV is not because I don't have it, it's because re-registering all the apps was going to take too long, <laughs> you know, and so, uh, and so I just haven't gotten around to it. And so I, I think that, so I don't know about the very newest one. I have the second gen and it works great. And for our producers who are watching, thank you so much for your questions. We have time for you to add some more questions. And remember, voting is really important as the questions that are voted up get into the show before we start the next half of our show. Next question. David Brady in New York City, our friend, says, okay, this is maddening. My LG 43-inch monitor, and he notes it's a 43UD79-B, no longer works via remote. New batteries. I tried a remote from the one at work. No dice. Any chance to get it going again? Alex? Maybe. <laughs> um, it, you know, I think I, it does worry me that you already tried a remote from r work. So if you're trying to, you, a lot of times when these things don't work, it's because the remote isn't working um, and not, and, but if it, if it fails where you have two different remotes, um, the only question is, does that remote 
uh, was it coded off? So they're, they're, they can be set up where they're only talking to that TV. So I would look and make sure in the manual that there's no way to change it so that the, the, the controller only works with a given TV. It's only matched with one. It could be that process of having to reset it. Of course, I would look at how to reset the controller as well as how to reset the TV from, you know, from the ground up to, to make absolutely sure that it's not something in, the, in just a, a handshake problem. And Bill? So one quick hack, if you want to find out if your remote is working and you have an old black and white uh, or any other kind of camcorder security cam, try pointing the remote at the camcorder and watch it. You can often see the IR blinking on the front of one of these remotes, and that'll tell you whether the signal's going out. The other thing that has confused me occasionally is I have the TV somewhere and I have put a tchotchke or something in front of it and just out of idle accident that was in front of the IR receiver on the TV and suddenly everything stopped working and just moving stuff away from the entire bezel of the TV sometimes will give you uh, access to remote again. Those are my two quick hacks. See if those work. If not, I'm sorry, it's something more serious. Next question. Next question, Tony Mobley in Noonan, Georgia. Can Keeley share her answer from yesterday regarding Discord and the server's users? Liberty was thanking her for such a great answer in the pre-show. Go ahead, Keely. Okay, I'm ready for this. So the question had been on Sunday, which is our philosophy day. Uh, how can I pin particular channels that are of most interest to me in Discord the way that you can in Slack and apps like that? And the answer is you cannot do that. Unfortunately, it's just one of the limitations of the interface. It, it it's like oh it's it's a web page. Discord is just a big web page with a database that underlies it, and most of us can't pin particular areas of a web page to say the top of the web page that point to other pages. It's it's just not the way that uh, that limitation works. But here are the ideas that I have that you can work around so that you can get to the content that you're most interested in. The Command K shortcut or Control K, I expect if you're on Windows. Uh, will help you jump quickly to the channels that you've just visited or with a few short keystrokes can help you search very quickly for the channels that you're looking at the most. Alex mentioned as well yesterday that he makes sure that he collapses the categories that contain channels that are that are fully read. So in Mac, that is uh, Command Shift A, and that'll clean up your view so that you're seeing the, just the unread channels and probably the ones that you're most interested in. And the other thing that I do is that I have Stream Deck profiles set up for my servers, and I can just quickly hit the text channels that I need to visit quickly and the most often, and that gets me there and in and out of voice channels very, very quickly. So those are a few ideas for people. Keely, if you don't answer another question today, <laughs> I want to say thank you for that. I didn't even think about the, the stream deck part of things. And for everyone, it was just such a relief that I was not going crazy that I was like, there has to be some way to be able to pin channels. So there, there we have it. Thank you, Keely. Next question. Douglas Carmichael is back again for a final mastering process bef processor before an LED wall, and he's looking for color adjustment and so forth. Would you use an FS HDR? Alex, typically not. Um, you know, we're we're using that because of the way that we're managing channels uh, and how we're processing it, getting ready to do a lot of HDR work. Uh, but we wouldn't usually use an FS HDR as, a, as that final mastering. There's a lot of tools that are built for LED walls. There's a couple different things that LED walls have to manage. And one is the matching between every single tile. Um, and those things are usually specialized to the um, uh, D3 is one of the ones that I think we use a lot to play stuff out. And it has some of those controls. But usually there's ones that are specific to the walls um, that we've seen used to, to do the final color correction. Next question. Andy Kokendorfer in Vera, Florida. Up next, was there a second hour on guest interviewing techniques? Alex? Uh, we Hopefully we can move over. John Snyder had one here. I'm not sure if this was the, um, it, was this the, the Michael Krasny uh, interview uh, that we had? Or, oops, I'm sorry. I'm just No, that was a panel to... discussion that Bill led oh. back in November. Yeah, yeah. Bill, Bill led one on, on interview techniques. Uh, we also had an interview, um, one with uh, Michael Krasny himself, uh, maybe a year and a half ago. And so those are two, those are probably the two sessions that we've had as second hours. Um, and I think that, uh, that it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't hurt to, to do another one. Next question. 
Next question comes to us from Zach Phillips in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. If you had a Mac Mini M2, a Ryzen PC, and an ATEM to build a dead simple, no graphics or super sources, hybrid space based on Zoom rooms, which tasks would you give to the Mac and which would you give to the PC? Jason? So um, because there are almost no constraints in your question, I, I'm kind of inclined to say it doesn't really matter. Um, I would... I would let the Mac do. I would let the Mac do the final zoom room, meaning it would be out from the ATEM, simply because it's very easy to do repeatable stuff. And um, Windows 10 is so incredibly annoying at like you know playing sound effects through things and and being weird in that way that you know you boot it up one day and it's just different somehow. Um, but other than that, as far as a play out, um, both of those systems are fully capable of, of, of handling it. So, yeah, that's kind of a mishmash answer, I know. But, yeah, it wouldn't really matter. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, I wouldn't use a Zoom room <laughs> if, I, if I had a Mac. Um, what I would do is probably have a uh, – you can do a Zoom room if you want. But the, I think the, the more efficient thing to do would be to use the Mac for Zoom ISO. And then I would have a uh, – I'd have a Zoom ISO instance with – I have one here. I just out of my reach. Uh, with a sonnet box and a and a and an eight channel output, and then just send eight channels out. Or you don't even need the hardware. You can have the Mac just go in as Zoom ISO and uh, use NDI to get to vMix or whatever on your PC. So I probably do a vMix on a PC to cut your show, and I would do a um, and I would take a Mac and have it go in as Zoom ISO and push those channels out to um, to the to the PC. And I think that'd probably be the best way to 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 mix and match those. Next question. Darren Sorello in Dallas, Texas. Last week on Office Hours, Alex expressed dislike for the new 14-inch MacBook Pro, but I missed the dislikes. Can you elaborate? I'm heading to the Apple Store today for an iPhone repair, and I don't want temptation to lead me down the wrong path. We're going to see the efficiency of Office Hours. Jason? Um, okay, so I dislike the form factor. It's too small for my lap. But more importantly, I don't think that it's it's cooled well enough. And then the real clincher is that the ports are wrong. Um, there aren't enough ports, and they they, they just oh, it drives me nuts. So yeah, I'll leave it to, I'll leave it to Keely for that. Go ahead, Keely. Well, great. Now I have to sit here and try to you know respond to what are really really good points that Jason made. But in defense of the 14-inch crew, I think what you need to do is, first of all, if you're going to the Apple Store, you are going to be led down Temptations Path. There is nothing you can do about that. But pick up a 14-inch, you know, at the store. Well, maybe don't walk out with it, but, you know, have a, have a good feel of it. Work with it a little bit. Buy it and take it home. You have 15 days. You have 15 days with which you can put it through all its paces. You can run it through all the crazy graphics, video processing, everything that you want to do. You can put it on your lap and see how it fits. You can put it in your bag and see how it fits. You can walk around and see what you think of that form factor for the way you work and your life. And I think that's the most important thing for me. I would never use a 16 inch. Of course, I'm 5'4", and I like I like things that can actually fit in a reasonable size bag, but that will, your mileage will vary for everybody. So you have 15 days, take advantage of them. And Alex? I think it really just depends on what you're doing with it. Um, uh, you know, I think that personally, I, I do a lot of things that are visual. If I'm opening up a laptop and not just typing. So if I'm on Discord or am I responding to things or typing things out or working on on flows, I'm usually on an iPad, so I don't really care. Uh, but if I'm opening up a 14 inch, if I'm opening up a MacBook on the road, it means that I'm opening up something that tends to be graphical. And I just find it to be such a small little, you know, thumbnail <laughs> of, a, of a screen for me to work on. And I have to admit that I'm still frustrated, though I don't have, I can't can't buy a 17 inch model, <laughs> you know, laptop. So so I really like having the real estate. And I also this the change in the size of the keyboard drives me like I just can't type on it very efficiently. So so it makes me I, I can type faster on the iPad. Um, typewriter, you know, um, uh, keyboard than I can on the on the one that comes with the 14 inch. So, so I, I think that that's the thing that drives me a little crazy. It has single handedly killed my interest in laptops. Like I just, I, I take it with me because I have to use stuff, and I just do everything I can do to avoid a laptop now because I just, it just makes me so frustrated. And Bill. I'm a little bit different in this. I still have a 15-inch MacBook Pro because that's my main driver every day. I sit here and do all sorts of video work and stuff like that on it. So having 15-inch diagonal 
main screen is important for me. But in the two external screens that I work with daily, actually there's three of them, but the two primary, a left monitor and a right monitor, I actually went down to, I think it was a 10.5 inch IPS monitor. And I've been really surprised. They're easier to travel with. They're actually smaller than my laptop folded. So I can put these two IPS screens in my laptop case with my computer and re-rig my basic desktop setup, even on the road. I love that. And because they're high, uh, high enough resolution, I can get all the content I want over there and actually read text and things like that. So I am more downsizable. I'll probably stick with a 15 for my main screen, but I'm thinking smaller can be better in terms of screen sizes if you're looking to do specific things, not everything on all in one machine. Go ahead, Jason. Well, and it's worth mentioning that the physicality, like your actual physicality is going to matter quite a bit. When Keely said she's 5'4", I'm thinking, wow, I'm nearly a, a, like a, a foot taller than you. So, of course, my arms are going to be longer, right? I'm going to be farther away from the screen, and that's going to make a huge difference as to what I expect from, from a laptop and what means too small or too big for me. So, you know, this really is one of these things where, um, you know, your outcome may vary. And Alex? And just to qualify, you know, someone said, well, you're not just on, not on a laptop person when I, when, so, when I said this in the past. I just want to point out that until I got that 14-inch laptop, uh, I was, a, a laptop was my primary computing device for almost 30 years. Like it was, you know, it was what I used day in, day out. And I decided that a 14-inch would be my primary. And now I, it, I, I open it, like I have to open it once a week to make sure it captures ca catches up with everything that it needs to have <laughs> like it's just and so uh so i just it's it was really uh if you're used to a larger screen you'll have a hard time going if you're not used to anything you might be it might be fine but if you're used to a larger screen and actually doing graphic work like photoshop or video editing or anything else the 14 inch screen is super painful and Tony Mobley says that he's got the 14 inch MacBook Pro M1 chip, Pro chip, and he's very happy with it. So there's a lot of conversation happening in the chat. Laptop or no laptop, 14 inch. Next question. Paul Terry Wallace from Austin, Texas. Discuss the various ways to do Mac screenshots like Command Shift 3, Command Shift 4, Command Shift 5, Command Shift 6 for MacBooks. And with the Command Shift 5 discussion, the two video recording buttons let you record your entire screen or a selection of it. Go ahead, John. Moving from a PC to a Mac, I don't know, 12 years ago or so, it was super refreshing to have those features, especially the one where you can select, which is Command Shift 4. And then I can select my region. And that's probably the number one thing I do on my computer on a daily basis is use that selectable screenshot feature is super useful in day-to-day -day business. The video one's kind of goofy how it works, but it's that's built into that's command shift uh five. Keely? So, well Oops. done. Keely? Yeah, I've just, as of this weekend, migrated to another free app that mimics some of those functionalities that are built into the Mac OS, but actually expand in ways that are I'm just surprised and delighted with. It's called Shotter, and you can find that at shotter.cc. I will put a link that can get transferred over to the chat. Uh, unfortunately, I can't use Ecamm today and show off everything it can do. But I've remapped all of the built-in keyboard shortcuts over to Shotter, and it's got some extra things like being able to capture a PNG of the scrolled web page, for example, and you can set it to what timing you want for that scroll, that sort of thing. You can have it automatically target a particular window, an active window, a different window to take to apply a transparency around your screenshot so you don't have to go into any other app and take that out. It is slick it's got just those extra things and then the editor window after you've taken your screenshot my biggest problem is is that i want to be taking a screenshot and then maybe adding a few little annotations and then pulling it into a discord chat for example this program allows me to set up nicely with a, a fine editing program, which then I can save. I can just copy that without even saving it, plunk it into whatever uh, app that I'm using. And I'm just in love with the feature set already. And it's free. So I would recommend it. Chris? A uh, couple other things. If you add in the control to those keyboard shortcuts, so Command-Shift-Control, it puts 
the thing that you copied actually into your clipboard that you can then paste, whereas the other one actually makes a file that sticks it on your, your, your desktop. And then the other one is uh, command shift for, and then uh, add the space or tap the space bar. And now your whatever window you hover over, it will make a copy of that whole window, including the alpha channel for the soft edge borders. So those are some other added things built into the... And Keely, what did you say the name of that app was? The app's called Shotter. Uh, Shotter. Yes, S-H-O-T-T-R dot C-C is the website. It will be in the event chat. Okay, cool. And Bill. And just a frustration uh, cure if you keep hitting Command Shift 6 and it doesn't seem to do anything. That'll take a screenshot of the touch bar on Macs that have touch bars. So if you don't have one, it's going to do nothing and just cause you much grief. Next question. Next question comes to us from Kenny Hampton in Greenville, Illinois. Are iOS apps available to allow the Insta360 Link camera to connect and record video to the device? I see for Android USB Pro app. Alex? Not that we know of. <laughs> Typically, an iOS app, uh, especially if you're going to use it in any kind of application, it's going to want to use its own uh, camera. So I don't know of any any place where you'd be able to have an external camera. I've never had an external camera successfully connect to the iPhone, except for Sony had a hardware one that that had some. Well, there's Sony and DxO both had ones that streamed to it um, from there, but it's not trivial. It's not just connecting it to the connector. There's a process of streaming through the lightning connection, which is not trivial, and it was very hard for both of those companies to do. Next question. Douglas Carmichael's next question is, I remember a NASA press release that used lighting for Major League Baseball stadiums as a point of comparison for amounts of energy. In a typical production, would video, lighting, or audio consume the most energy? Go ahead, John. I think the reason why NASA compared lights is because we can all relate to the brightness of lights in a stadium. But as we've moved to LEDs, I'm certain the most energy expensive thing in a stadium is any sort of climate control. Uh, to heat or cool the stadium costs way more energy than just to provide lighting for it. I don't know hey. about the other parts. Jason? Yeah, uh, no doubt um, HVAC would be the most. But since that's not on the list, I would say uh, lighting is still going to consume the most energy. Go ahead, Bill. But that pro profile has changed. Back in the days when we mostly relied on tungsten for lighting, it was incredibly energy inefficient. Almost uh, just huge chunks of the power went to heat rather than actually light. As they moved into these more efficient for, uh, forms, color balance, fluorescence, and now LEDs rule the world, the energy drawn these things, particularly field lighting and things like that, have dropped by orders of magnitude. So it's better than it used to be. Alex? It depends on whether the light, it depends on how many LED walls you have and how many lights you have. <laughs> like it's, so both of the, they've all become more efficient, but to put it in perspective, the stage that we have in, in uh, or not that we have, but we have access to in San Rafael has 2000 amps, three phase, so 6000 amps, and it wasn't enough to run the LED walls that, that, we, were, that we were looking at for something. And so uh, we, we were gonna have to bring more from the substation in to make that actually happen. So um, it, the LED walls can be extremely power intensive um, as they, we, we've had entire uh, cat, you know, cat generators just to run the LED wall. So video can be higher. The video capture and the production and the audio capture and production are minuscule compared to the LED and potentially the lighting rigs. And Keely. I think there's also other aspects of a sporting production that, you know, you maybe you're not always going to see uh, evidently, which, for example, in field hockey, we currently use a type of surface that is water-based. It requires watering of an artificial turf in order for it to be at its optimal playing and most safe playing uh, aspect. And we're going through a major transition in the sport, trying to move to a waterless artificial turf that can still play quickly and still provide all the protection that the players need for skin injuries and, and other impact injuries and torque injuries. So there's a big energy component that comes into supplying that water, especially in certain areas of the world. And it, these are some of the obstacles that people go 
through. So there's groundskeeping sort of issues as well in, in terms of energy expenditures with all of that, that I think all of the major sports, all of the minor sports as well are taking into consideration and really trying to move quickly too, so that they can continue to be a viable sport into the future. Next question. Terry, uh, Paul Terry Wallace in Austin, Texas, has this one. Real Good takes all movies and or TV and tells you where to watch. It notes subscriptions like Netflix and Prime to freebies, uh, Crackle, Tub, Tubi TV, and so forth, to TV everywhere options like FX, ABC, and Fox, to even rental purchases like iTunes, Amazon, Vudu, and is it the top media guy? He, guide, he wonders. Jason? Um, I, I'm trying to parse your question. I, I'm unaware of anything that does what Real Good does. Um, and if that's what you're after, then the answer is yes. It, really, you just kind of put that, uh, um, it took that and put it on its side. So generally what, what I've heard Real Good being used for is I subscribe to this, that, these, and those. And it will tell you, oh, okay, here are the ways to get what you need um, no matter what. And I'm sorry, my phone's going off. But yeah, that's my answer. Next question. Next question comes from Harshid Trivedi here on the panel from Daytona Beach, Florida. Saturday, we lost Judy Human, trailblazing advocate who has also had a doc named Crip Camp, which was based on her impacts in the disability space. What are some things you'd advocate for personally that you feel makes an impact on others? Go ahead, Alex. I would create a a very large group of people that can answer questions every day about technical things. <laughs> now, where would we do that, Alex? I, I have know. no I, idea. It sounds crazy, but I think that we could get like 10 or 12 people to like come together and answer questions just on the fly as people came in. God, who um, would do with that for free? I mean, come uh, on. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. But that's what I would do. Next question. Next question comes from Douglas Carmichael, and he said, would the use of a portable monitor and portable mechanical keyboard be a solid compromise when using a 14-inch MacBook Pro, portability for everyday tasks, and a larger screen when you need it? Alex? I would follow Keeley's advice and, and buy it for 14 days and see how it works for you. Bill? And I, you know, I mentioned that in my case, I've just been able to extend my screen real estate by using these relatively inexpensive 10 and a half inch monitors. Uh, my old MacBook Pro drives two of them fine. So I actually don't have just the 15 inch main screen, but I actually have, I actually have four, four screens that are attached to my laptop, giving me four different places to look when I need information. Next question. Paul Terry Wallace, Austin, Texas. How many YouTube videos do you watch in an average day? And how do you handle playlists, cues, searches, and so forth? Go ahead, Kiwi. Uh, <laughs> Liberty's laughing because she knows my answer is going to be all of them. I do spend a lot of time on YouTube learning about my craft, whether it be in Discord, whether it's content creation, whether it's hockey umpiring, there's all kinds of things. So I have a variety of tools and I, I know we're getting close to the hour, so I don't want to go on too long. But I do make sure that I use different profiles and different accounts for each of my subject areas, that really helps. I do have private playlists that I set up, including my to watch playlist. But what I've found is things get lost in that. So what I've turned to doing as I've now incorporated this with my podcasts, with my books, is that I create tasks and click up for each of the videos that I think I'm actually going to get something out of. And I want to be able to retain some of the information that I'm learning from those videos. So I will paste the YouTube URL into a new task and I'll prepare just a, it's a really short little template of things that, you know, this is what I'm expecting to learn. This is what I actually learned and this is how I'm going to apply it just to create a more of a conscious way of consuming this stuff because I can just get on a treadmill and just be stuffing images through my brain and not any of it penetrating. So I, I've been working on that for a couple of weeks now and I'll get back to you in, in the future if you want about how that experiment's going. But I think we need to be conscious consumers of these things. And especially if you're doing it for professional purposes, having a system around it's really going to help. Alex? Mine is very scientific. Like I, I have a huge plan for how I handle YouTube and I watch YouTube probably more than I watch anything else. So I, so just say like, I don't, 
I am a 80% YouTube consumer. Like I don't, uh, there's, YouTube is really big. And then I usually watch one TV show with my family at night. And then I watch some little bit of TikTok and that's kind of, and I probably watch, I don't know, 10 or 15 YouTube videos a day um, that are, you know, in, the, in you know, a, a, some range. Um, I uh, don't have, I, anything that I think I can't get to, I put in watch later. <laughs> There's a long list of things that I could go, I go, I can't get to this right now, but it looks really interesting. I put it in watch later. Um, and then after that, it's, it's mostly whatever comes to my head that I need to do. I don't use, I don't use it as a general study tool as much as I use it as a, I need to know how to do this right now. So anything that I'm interested in, I jump up on YouTube and go, I need to, I need this now. And I see a list of those things. Um, if I watch the video and it asks to subscribe in the first minute, I probably never watch that, that channel again. Um, if there's, if they don't get to the point in about 90 seconds, um, you know, uh, the big thing that I do is I open it as soon as they start talking, if there's anything slow at the beginning, I grab onto the cursor and start moving it. And I look for where the hills are. And then I just start jumping to hills. Uh, I'm like, okay, like, let's, let's get to the point here. <laughs> like, you know, so I just look for the hills. Um, and so the hills are the most valuable part of a YouTube channel for me is like, if they're, if, especially with YouTube creators who talk too much and don't get to the point. So, um, so anyway, so, and that's about 80%, 90% of them uh, are, are just uh, too verbal, ver too uh, verbose. And so I just skip to the parts where I see hills and then I watch that and I go to the next video. I look in the comments <laughs> and I see what people say yeah, in the yeah. comments. They tell you like, start here. I'm like, thank you very much. <laughs> I, I will admit though, I'm super sensitive. Like I jump on and I go, bad audio, bad video, bad whatever. And I just like, let's look, let's see if somebody else did this more efficiently, <laughs> like, you right. know, and so, and so I'm, I'm, I'm super brutal. I'm a brute. I watch it a lot, but I'm super brutal about content on, on YouTube of what I'm, what I'm willing to put much time into. Well, thank you so much, producers. We are now at the top of our hour, top of the hour. And as we switch gears and we're going to get into this discussion, what I hope to be a lively discussion on AI, some of the tools and the ways that you can use it outside of like we've, we've had conversations around mid journey and chat GPT and recipes and all of that. But on Mondays, we tend to speak more on the sales, marketing and business side of things. So I thought it would be really interesting for us to really look at some of the ways that you can use these tools to do things like fundamentally when you are thinking about a business and some of the elements that go into it is if whether you're a solopreneur, a small business, or even inside of a corporation that you're looking at, you know, you've got your operation side of things. And the, here, this is what I was thinking, like, you know, how can we use AI to, you know, help support operations, whether that be things like your financials, and you've got spreadsheets to create and their formulas. I, I don't have examples on that today. Um, we can always this is going to be a conversation that's going to be happening for for years to come. But again, operations, how can we use some of these tools to help us in in those areas. Um, you've also got, you know, your sales side of things and whether that be cold, cold emails, whether that be even if you've got um, notifications or to, to send out. Uh, I've got an example that I'm looking forward to sharing on even, hey, can you help me with a business plan? Um, some of the fears or concerns is AI replacing people, replacing jobs. And while that is a very valid point in case, using AI tools to help alleviate, like save your brain power so you can really optimize some things that instead of sitting there and racking your brain on what you need to say in your cold email, your outreach emails, your sales deck, that the AI can help to jog get some ideas going so that then you can really customize it to really work for yourself and work for your brand. So I started with like the operation side of things and we went into like the sales part of things and then just your standard day to day, whether that is having someone who could be a production uh, or sorry, an assistant of some sort um, or even looking at areas of I don't want to do too much around content creation because that is what you see a lot out there. But again, there are different ways that it can be used. And to quickly jump into some of these examples before getting to the panel, just get here to share my screen. Almost there, folks. And it was really cool in trying to 
trying to like come up with some of these some of these workflows. Uh, I don't know. I'd love to see in the chat how many people have heard of Copy AI or using even Copy AI, and that's one of those tools that will help just write your copy. Um, that's one of the ones even before. People were really using ChatGPT. I have a lot of founder friends who would use that to help them with their pitch decks or help them with their investor letters. So as an example here, if we say, I'm going to say to, you know, copy AI, I'm going to say that, you know what, um, let's write, here we go, oops, down here in the prompt, I'm going to ask it to write a one page media announcement for a live stream summit for underrepresented founders raising capital. So once I put that prompt in and prompting is really important when it comes to what you're actually asking the, the platform, whichever one you're using, what you want it to spit out, what it's going to create. So. I don't know about you, but if you do not have a, a fully functional PR team or vendor who you're working with and you're just trying to get something together to get started, something like this could be really helpful. And as you'll see here, it's put somewhat of a, you know, an immediate, uh, a media release together in that format so that now I could, you know, maybe tell it if I wanted to add the date or additional information that then it would then go ahead and create, you know, another iteration of it. And it's really interesting because I used this exact prompt yesterday and hopefully I still have it. No, that is, let's see if I still have it here to share with you. So this one, this is what it shared with the exact same prompt. This is what it shared yesterday. And it like went down to the specifics of a lineup and it even pulled some people. I've, I've worked with Jewel Burks, Arlen Hamilton, and it pulled names. So it's just interesting how it was able to pull that information. But for your specific event, you now, you know, of course, we always suggest to take this copy and put it through some of those plagiarism tools to just see if there are any blurbs or any parts of that that, um, you know, has been lifted because you don't want to get into any trouble for that. But then here it is in less than a minute, less than two minutes, I've been able to have somewhat of a framework for a media release for that to go out um, to the community. I do want to share just two quick, I won't put the prompts in, but share with you some other ones that I pulled together. Um, so this one was actually, you know, I mentioned business operations, that part of your day to day. For example, if you needed to put together a business plan or some sort of plan strategy and being able here, I was very specific again, going back to the idea of what prompts look like. So this one, I asked ChatGPT, I said, act as if you're a digital marketing expert who wants to create an online course to help women in business to learn how to create content to promote their businesses, write a detailed business plan and steps to make $1 million in 12 months. I'm okay with being the test case for this one. So let's see what ChatGPT had put together. And it literally has put together an executive summary the target market, and even somewhat of a marketing promotion strategy here. So again, if this is an area that might not necessarily be a strong suit for you, sometimes if you've got to write a mission statement, if you've got to get down your core values, those things can be somewhat of a heavy lift or daunting, but by putting it into areas like Playground or putting it into ChatGPT or even copy AI, that is something that can really help to speed up your workflow because it's done some of the heavy lifting for you. And now there's a frame of reference where you can start adding your ideas and adding your perspective to it. And it even went as far as, and, and initially it it's only spit out probably right around here to like giving me ideas of what the course could actually look like, but it actually shared a revenue model <laughs> and some projections on, well, it, let's say you, you need to get a thousand customers because I was specific in saying to it that I put a number there of what the target is of trying uh, revenue trying to, that I'm trying to reach. And it said, well, let's assume you retain 90% 
percent. I think that number is a little high. So, again, you take all of this with a grain of salt, but it broke down what projected revenue could be. Of course, this is no replacement for a CPA to help you through that. But this, again, is just something for if you've got an idea, a way to quickly flush out an idea or a concept. And the last one before getting to the panel, I asked it to write a sales plan to attract two hundred thousand to attract two hundred thousand dollars in ticket sales for a live stream event for startup founders with three different prices. So it put together this plan. Um, I would I will say that it was um, there was a part. OK, so then I I was OK with the beginning part. I was like, OK, I asked for details. I was actually looking for some more numbers for it to say this is um, what I needed to do. And that's when you're looking at chat GPT or any of these, it's you're able to like not just necessarily take that first iteration of the content that they shared with you, but to actually say, OK, no, let's let's be more specific. So I asked it, I said, can you give me a breakdown of how many tickets will need to generate that two hundred dollars and saying that this event would be in you know the city of Atlanta? So it did. It went ahead and it broke down the calculations for me. And for those of you who you know, the math side of things may not necessarily be a strong suit. Or again, you are looking at something, you might be in the middle of a meeting, this could help you in the middle of a meeting to be quickly see is this something that's viable or not. So just as a frame of reference for um, for everyone who's watching all of our producers, that this is just again, coming out the content part is is easier said than done. A lot of people are talking about content and how it will help with social and how it will help with transcription, which is all very great and valid. But for those who may not be in the content creation side of things, but you are actually in the back office or that there are still ways that you can use utilize this to help you to really optimize and really be in your genius zone in your business. Let's get into the panel. Alex. Really good for soup. Um, I, I we talked about that in the past. Uh, ChatGPT. I, I I just made the Osh soup that ChatGPT gave me um, uh, again last night. I, I've been tweaking it, and the reason I bring that up is that it's really good. I got me eight quarts of it <laughs> last night. So anyway, so um, but uh, the 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 interesting thing is is the soup is a good metaphor for how I use all of this stuff, which is that I don't use it verbatim. I use it as a as a component or as a research tool. So I asked it for a, re a recipe and then I've been riffing on that recipe and making it bigger and making it more complex and making it, you know, what I need it to be over time. But it gave me a good seed to work with. And I think that that's where I'm, um, uh, that's, that's what's been really successful for me. And so a lot of times with ChatGPT, uh, I have ChatGPT on a screen opened all the time. I pay for the 20 bucks a month or whatever. So I have it and I use it all day and I go, explain to, explain this to me. <laughs> and I just have it explain something to me. And then I look at it and I go, if I know it, I go, well, maybe, maybe that's the case. And then I Google, but the, here's the thing is that I don't know what to Google sometimes. And so I just go, explain this to me. And it gives me a bunch of stuff. And then I start grabbing onto the terms that it brought up. And then I start Googling it to, to kind of under, to build under what that is. And I can learn something, the, the mixture of searching what other people are writing and what ChatGPT does, um, you know, because ChatGPT sometimes summarizes things in kind of an odd way, sometimes doesn't quite hit the mark. And if I search things that I know, I know that it doesn't do that. And that's the number one thing I would recommend with any of these, especially ChatGPT is, Research things that you already know first. It lets you set a uh, a reference point of how accurate ChatGPT is, which is about sixty to seventy <laughs> percent. Like so, so, so you know, so so it's not you know like you. At, but but when you talk to coders, for instance, they're having using it all the time, and what they're doing is saying, "Write me this," and it writes it, and it gets through most of it is correct, and ah, that doesn't work, you know. And I'm going to change a couple of things. So right now I would say that ChatGPT is not a good beginner tool. It's really good if you already know what you're looking at and you just don't wanna go through the trouble of figuring out the best way to structure that. And, and it structures things really well, you know? And so like literally I, um, I'm i starting to do things where I, I write stuff. I have a, a bad habit of my, my 
my, I don't want to sound like I have two personalities. I'm, I actually have six. No, I'm just kidding. So um, the uh, but but I have a writing voice that I when I type, and I have a speaking voice, and the two of them are very very different. And my writing voice is not great, in my opinion. <laughs> so so I, I have a tendency to use a lot of passive verbs, and so I have to work on stuff. What I have been doing with some things is I take my my text and I just go write this correctly or write this according to Strunk and White or write this according to, you know, and I, and I ask it to uh, properly edit this and it will reword what I did <laughs> with active verbs, you know, like, you know, and, and just, just, and just re, and, and restructure. And sometimes I don't like it, but I have it do it all the time just to see what it does. And I, and then I still, you know, play back and forth, but man, does it save me a lot of time. I had something that like 10 pages and I just threw it in there, got it back. And it was like, oh, that's a lot better. And then I changed a couple things that it screwed up um, for, Mid Journey, I, I'm using Mid Journey right now for a presentation. I pulled some stuff out and sanitized it so I could show it. Um, this is an example of stuff that I'm doing for my presentation. Uh, let me see if I uh, can do this here. So if you see, so I'm going to try to get this to work. Hold on. There we go. So this is like one of my little presentations. So I'm talking about the how we move through media. Um, you know, all of these images are... Uh, chat or our mid journey. <laughs> so, so I, you know, and I just said, give me, you know, something over white. And I produced maybe a hundred of them. And then, and then I had that, you know, and then you know, talking about what's next. And so then it does this and then it does. Whoop, and, um, and then this is talking about the evolution of things that we don't like. <laughs> so, so, and all of this again is, uh, mid journey. <laughs> so, so of, of producing these things. Um, and it would have been very, very hard to find that kind of stuff in, uh, you know, on, you know, to find stock images that did what I want and looked a little over the top would have been pretty hard for me to, for me to actually do. Um, even this, this thing where I'm talking about something that people may not like. Um, anyway, so, and, and this is, um, I think it was like three people with glasses in the style of Pixar, <laughs> you know, so, so it was, you know, and so I got these kind of fun, but, but I'm, my ability to add, uh, you know, fun things to my presentation that aren't boring and that illustrate what I'm trying to illustrate. And I'm literally the entire, the challenge that I'm giving myself is the entire presentation is all mid journey. Like I, there's a couple images in there that I grab, but almost all of it is. And it's so much, and, and I got to say, it's fun. What I do is I sketch it out just to kind of talk about the process a little bit. I, you know, I type my outline in, in notes and then I sketch it out in, 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 um, uh, in keynote, but on my iPad. And then I make little lists of like, I want three people like this, or I want this thing to be here. And I, and I do it. And then I start searching on mid journey. I start putting them in and then I do it again. And then I start annotating it and I start asking mid journey for some more things. It's, uh, I don't know. I don't know. This, this is going to be a really fun uh, deck, <laughs> you know, and, and, and I had a lot of fun making it, you know, I think that that's the thing. So those are the two things that I'm using the most right now. Obviously there are, I mean, the, the possibility of knowledge being able to be as someone who doesn't read very much, doesn't like to read very much. And I like to listen to things. The, the, the last thing I'll say is that the, imp, the impact of AI reading text is probably one of the biggest changes in the distribution of knowledge in the history of the world. You know, like it is not like it is going to change everything, every magazine, every paper, every to be able to not just verbatim read it, but understand that this is bibliography. This is stuff that I shouldn't do. This is and being able to do it into any language and have it sound listenable and everything else is going to transform the, the world. And I'm pro I'm very excited as someone who's been frustrated that I can't read, listen to magazines for a long, for many years. Uh, I am like 30 years. Uh, I am super excited about what that means. John? Yeah, so far we've talked a lot about generative AI or creating content using AI, and I think that's going to be a big part of it. But the huge sea change we'll see is the benefit that artificial intelligence will allow us to do is finally reach personalization in a, in a true and meaningful sense. And where we see in the call center industry AI going right now is IVRs or the phone trees that you call into, the most advanced state-of-the-art ones can actually detect based off your tone of voice, the speech patterns you have, the words you use, what your sentiment is, as well as identify which person in a call center might best be able to handle your questions. And that's true personalization is, is picking the right person to handle this customer, whether it's looking up the customer database about their demographic information, their needs, their wants, their previous conversations, match you up with the same call center representative, that sort of thing. And that will really allow businesses to treat each individual like an individual through 
massive data collection and analysis. Uh, other places we see AI is, is in that analysis, not just collecting data, but being able to find meaningful trends and patterns in data, whether it's looking at images in the medical field and making better diagnoses than doctors can make because AI has a larger data set to pull from. Um, those are the sorts of things I think AI will be much, much more important to society as a whole. Even simple things like an AI being able to watch everything that happens in an organization like Microsoft currently has with its Viva products and be able to identify which people in the org are best to work on a specific project, what times of the day are best for you to work on this specific project. So it becomes your personal assistant to make sure you're using your day the best you can. Yeah, there was um, someone that uh, a student in one of my my classes where she shared that the she was actually purchasing something on a website and what came back was she abandoned the cart and there was a video that responded to her via email and saying, hey, is there anything else we can do to help you because you did not purchase this or this? Did you know and gave her all of these insights into what she and she was blown away. So just even as you said, John, the personalization aspect of it, that that's a huge market for it. And it will shift just like we've been for years has been talking about the personalization and content and what gets served up to you. But now seeing how that plays out with AI. Go ahead, Chris. Everybody knows how I feel, so I won't go into all that stuff about the AI thing. But um, first of all, John, uh, I find when I get stuck in a, a, a phone, like automated phone thing, if you curse incessantly, you get to a human much quicker. Um, but, um, you know, historically, if you go back to the early 2000s and the advent of RSS, I, I, I used to I used to wake up every morning and I had a, a whole list of tabs that I would go to and I would read all the different Mac rumor sites because they all had different writers, they all had, di they had different reporters, they, they garnered their information from different places. And it was interesting. There would be eight, maybe 10. I can't even remember the name of those sites now because what ended up happening with the advent of RSS was there was a period of time where all those Mac rumor sites still existed, but they were all reporting the exact same information with just a different style wrapped around it, different fonts, different colors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it was the same information because it was just an RSS feed that they were sucking information off of and then putting it on their site. Now there's nothing to watch but, you know, Mac rumors. And I'm wondering, and this is a specific question to like, Preto and Liberty and Alex, anybody, do you find that when you are reading certain things, can you tell that it is AI generated? Also, and I'll say this, uh, we were talking about YouTube in the first hour. I watch an insane amount of YouTube. I am seeing more and more and more videos where it is obvious to me that the scripts are generated by AI. Can you tell that the human is being removed from the process. And it, and I, I just foresee a similar frustration uh, like I had when I got tired of reading the exact same Mac rumor news because it was all generated by the RSS feed. Now it's being generated by a computer. Can you hear the difference in the tone? Can you hear, and Liberty's gonna break her neck. She's nodding so <laughs> furiously. Uh, Alex, John, anybody else? Can you can you see when something is written by a, a computer? Yes, the, that's a hard yes. Even with the the copy that was pulled here, uh, the the women business plan or whatnot, and I could see the parses like that is across like every website, and that's where I actually think that there is some of the jobs that I think that will really pop off um, with AI is our editors, copy editors that will, okay, somebody might come and have that first form. They did it with AI, but someone who comes in to spruce it. And I think that we're still in that first phase of everyone getting used to these tools. Copy sprucer. <laughs> Coffee sprucer, yes, but we're still in that first phase and that we're going to see that, hence the need for these plagiarism tools and what's going to separate people. And this is why we're having this conversation today is like, how can this help you so that you can really stand out even more because you're not doing some of what could seemingly be monotonous aspects of it. But yes, I do see that. And 
it, it while while alarming, there's still a huge opportunity for now adding your voice to it because it's saving you time. Alex? Yeah, I think that there, there's going to be a lot of, like, I, I was joking with another show that, that mid journey is, is going to create a huge business for a mid journey touch up artists because it's oftentimes you'll get something so close to what you want, but it's not quite right. Um, and, uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, and so you're fixing it. So all the images that I showed earlier, I fixed a little bit in, in Photoshop or, or something else to, to clean it up a little bit from the raw output. And I think that you're going to have the same thing for a while, you know, with chat GPT. I, I will say that as someone who reads chat GPT a lot, I do recognize certain things, certain setups, the way that they, the way that they set the idea up is very predictable. I don't think that's going to be predictable for long, but in its current state, it has a certain way of setting up ideas that is pretty, pretty, uh, uh, you know, pretty viewable there. Um, and I'm going to turn uh, Chris's uh, mic off there. Um, and um, anyway, so the, uh, but, but I, so I think that that's, that is um, something I can see. I will say that for the most part, the most recognizable thing about ChatGPT is that it is much better English than most people write. So it is English, it, it is, uh, you know, a, a, it's more active verbs. It's what makes it sound so sure of itself is not that it's sure of itself. It's that it's using active verbs the way, where they should be used. And it's not using uh, passive verbs very often. It, it, it's minimizing all of that as it constructs it. And so the, the thing that I find that the most interesting about it is it's actually doing, I mean, most researchers would benefit from running most of their stuff through ChatGPT just to rewrite it with more active word <laughs> verbs. And it would, it would be much more readable. It's, I find that ChatGPT is very readable because um, the quality of, uh, con of sentence construction by most academics, government, um, medical, all those things, the, co the, the construction of their sentences are so bad that it's really hard to read most of their research. And I think chat, you know, AI can make that a lot better. John? Just like tools like Midjourney, the first iteration is not very good. Where you can really make prompts that create ChatGPT transcripts that are not recognizable is by being very, very specific in your prompts, giving your ChatGPT some instruction on what you want and the parameters you want it to follow, because otherwise it summarizes the whole internet. And the problem with that is it summarizes average stuff. And so the writing comes across as really average and very cliche. And so, yes, you can tell when somebody is using something like ChatGPT as a sort of a, a content generation mill and they're just shoving stuff out and it's poorly done. I think that there's probably a lot of content on the internet that you are reading that has been created by ChatGPT from people who know how to write good prompts and you cannot tell that is written by ChatGPT though. And Bill? Since I do a lot of narration work, I'm starting to see scripts that are clearly chat GPT generated, they all have a particular, I don't know, diffusion voice where you can just, it's one of those. I can see them about two paragraphs in, I can go, this wasn't a human being, this was just generated and somebody's just trying to create content and they want to turn out a lot of content. And as a narrator and voice guy, uh, reading them, it, it's simple, it's easy because they all follow all the rules correctly. So the paragraphs all read fine. There's just nothing behind them. And John. I have too much T TLDR. Um, so so OpenAI launched, you know, seven years ago. GPT-3 came out in 2020. A lot of the APIs on these third-party applications that you see, Jasper, Copy, and 20 others are using the GP3 API. Chat GPT came out in November of 2022. It uses a different model than GPT-3 does using 3.5. And they've been working with Microsoft for five years. And so now you're gonna see all the big companies integrate AI into the normal applications that we see on a daily basis. And AI is gonna kind of disappear in our normal routines. And so as soon as Adobe integrates generative into Photoshop, it's game over because everything's gonna go into layers and I'm gonna have infinitely editable work to be done inside the application. So text to text, image to image, image to text, image to video, video to video. There's some amazing things coming. This is a huge groundswell. This is as big as the internet itself. 
All right. Looks like we've got these questions going. Producers, you have time to ask all your questions, AI, business, marketing, and we'll get to them. Let's get into it, Bill. That first question comes from Morgan Price in Victoria, British Columbia. Where do you think angel investors should seek to invest in the space of AI and digital first events? What needs do you have where you think AI could be helpful? Great question, Alex. I think that we want to look at, at how AI and how these tools can build more bespoke the, the advantage of AI is that right now we're kind of funneling everybody into some kind of structure um, that, you know, we we have a way of doing tools and we're going to build them. And so you end up with Zoom events and you end up with a hop in and you end up with things that are trying to just kind of funnel everybody into a structure that we have. What the possibility of AI as we move forward is the ability to have it be something where you talk to it and you say, well, I'm on an event that does this and I want it to do that and I want it to build this out and you can start to organically build a solution that isn't any one of those things. Now, those that doesn't exist right now, but if I was saw an event company that was able to do that because you know, what's gonna happen is that kind of thought process, the you know, building these kind of highly scalable bespoke events is going to plow everything else under and and so it's but the ai will help you will help people build those out in a way but the the kind of the off the shelf um, modular whatever that's being done right now is not going to survive the next generation so i would be constantly looking for how does ai help generate bespoke solutions in general next question Next question comes to us from Mike Edwards in Brooklyn, New York. Morning, guys. What AI tools do you recommend specifically for branding and or marketing that help you serve better? John? I would use something like a ChatGPT or, or Bing's chatbot. And what I would do is I would start by saying, create a marketing plan that has these criteria. And then you can say, I want three social media posts that have three different related topics, and then give it the, the, the main topic idea. Maybe it's some digital versus event you're going to do. And that will give you that generic um, ChatGPT response that we've been talking about. Then give it a sample of your very best writing and ask ChatGPT, how would you describe the voice that this writing is composed of? And it will tell you what kind of voice you have that it understands. Once you have that voice, you say, okay, now take my original marketing plan and I want you to compose those three social media posts using this voice and you copy and paste the voice that it gave you. And suddenly what you'll see is the content it generates will sound a lot more like something you would have done than something that the GPT would have done by itself. Bill? I was, it made me smile. I was looking at Liberty's marketing plan that Chad GPT had generated for her. And I noticed that, that it was $10,000 for something, $20,000 for content creation, and then $500,000 for marketing and advertising. And that told me everything I need to know about its perception of how to succeed. It, it's like the content is kind of important, but what's really important is making as many impressions as you can with that. And it just tells me that we're in a world where people are selling things without much value. And if they have enough marketing clout behind it, they can succeed even though there's not really maybe a product there that is worthy of succeeding. That scares me a little bit. Alex? I, I talked about it earlier. I, I just think that getting good at something like mid-journey is really worth it. Like I would definitely have a base. I mean, it's just, uh, I again, ChatGPT and mid-journey open for me almost all the time. Um, and I'm using it all the time. And I use them as entertainment as much as I use them for work. Someone just says something funny and I'm like, oh, I wonder what that would look like. And I start playing with it and I, and I noodle, noodle about with it. Not only is it a lot of fun, though, is, is that building fun images and fun things that you can use um, and diagrams and so on and so forth. It's just uh, it, it, it's revolutionized what I'm doing. So I, I would say MidJourney is definitely a tool that I would, I would highly recommend. Uh, to add to that, I would say tools like, um, for example, go ahead, copy AI. It has a free element. There's a free day trial. Try that out because your question asks for branding and marketing. And a part of that is things like determining, figuring out the, the voice or figuring out the story that you want to convey for a specific product or a specific event. So by putting prompts into something like a copy AI, I did one um, where it was like the hero's journey. So I said uh, that as an instructor who's trying to help women, tell me the best way to, and I think it was like the, the hero story. And 
actually it spit out maybe like or, or <laughs> exported like five or six options, which in I was like, ooh, I like the way it said it this way and I like the way it said it that way. So then that now going back into what John was saying with just, you know, the marketing plan and now coupling that with something like a copy AI that gives you the actual language that will be more colorful. So to Chris's point, it won't sound like it's coming from something like a, you know, AI, even though it is because you've got that colorful um, content there. Also, we use Descript and Descript is whether that is putting for your video, for importing videos and audios and getting the captions for that, getting the transcripts, that has been a tremendous help. So we're pumping out way more video content for our clients um, with the captions and, and because it's in somewhat of a, a cloud-based um tool, then we have multiple people who are in there and doing that as well. And I was trying to find there is Synthesia is also another one um, that I'll come back to because it's an that's an answer for another question. But um, and I will try to come back to the business channel in Discord because I have a couple of friends who have been using one for like logos, logo development and just getting some ideas around, hey, this is the name that we're thinking about using for a startup. And it gives it ideas around that. So those are just some of the couple of ways that you can use some of these tools to help with your branding and your marketing. Alex? Uh, the, uh, do, do you talk to your logo? I've done stuff on Midjourney where I produce. I put a name in or I put an idea in of what, it, what it's there and I generate hundreds of them. Do I use any of them verbatim? No. Do they get me my juices flowing to think about what that looks like? 100%. It is so fast to get so many ideas to just kind of think about and plug away at. It's just, it's just really, it's really great. It comes up with things that I would never think of. And some of them are horrible and some of them are great. Um, the other thing I would look at is Whisper, you know, the Whisper.ai stuff. And there's a thing called Mac Whisper, which I'm, I'm testing a new version of right now. And um, it is, uh, it's really powerful. This is, again, kind of like Descript. Um, and it's a standalone. You can drop stuff. You can drop something into it, and it'll just pump out the the SRT or the you know or the VTT or whatever you need for your captions. Um, but it can also do tons of translation. It can do a lot of those things really quickly. And there's going to be a there's going to be a point where you know lots and lots of events are just pumping out. And, and again, it's going to start getting to a point where it knows who was talking and how they were talking. And what you're going to end up with is the ability to absorb all of this information to turn it all into text, to know, you know, delineate who's talking about it, to convert it into many languages, and then to put different voices on every person that was talking that is similar to the person that talked on stage or talked in the event and push all of that stuff out um, to make it available to the world. And so the amount of information, and this is just something that is just raw distribution uh, of, of content is going to be just massive and much more accessible than it ever has been in the past. And then just putting in Albi shared video, um, video.ai, that's one that I've heard uh, a lot of my friends using for podcasts and for social promotion as well. And Mike, just to add, like in this whole conversation as well, it's taking these elements and then putting them either at the beginning of your workflow, in the middle of your workflow to help get those, not only those ideas and that inspiration to help you move your, your marketing concepts along. Next question. Ronnie Hossoy in Tromsø, Norway says, should we differentiate between AI and machine learning and how? Go ahead, John. A couple of points on this. this uh, machine learning is a, is a subset of AI. AI as a general use is, is probably overused today, but it's kind of like, it's kind of like what happened with podcasting, where if you weren't involved with pod, you know, iPods anymore, like we are today, they still call them podcasts. So using that label is, is vernacular now in our industry. Now the, the, there's a big difference between narrow AI, which is what we're seeing today with chat GPT mid journey. We would consider all those narrow AI and then artificial general intelligence is the next loop. Uh, to overcome next hurdle, next milestone. And that's a game changer. We're still a decade out from that still. So I think AI, I use AI more so than machine learning because AI, people understand it more so than what machine learning is. Go ahead, Alex. I thought it was appropriate to ask ChatGPT the difference. I just thought, you know, like, let's just ask, here's what ChatGPT said. Um, ChatGPT said, artificial intelligence and machine learning are related concept, concepts, but they are not the same thing. 
AI is a broad field of computer science that aims to create intelligent machines that can perform tasks that typically require human intelligence, such as natural language processing, problem solving, decision making, and image recognition. Machine learning, on the other hand, is a subfield of AI that focuses on the development of algorithms that can learn from data and make predictions or decisions without being explicitly programmed to do so. ML algorithms use uh, statistical techniques to identify patterns in large data sets and then use these patterns to make predictions or decisions. In other words, AI is a broader field that includes machine learning as one of its subfields. Machine learning is a specific technique used within AI to enable machines to learn from data and improve their performance on specific tasks. <laughs> Which I thought is not too bad. Like it was, I was like, eh, you know, the machine described it pretty well uh, of, of my understanding of it as well. So anyway, I just thought that'd be, and, Again, that's usually how it starts. Like I will throw something up there like that. The other thing I'll do is I'll, I'll say, explain to them, explain to this to me like I'm a five-year-old and it's pretty fun of how it explains things like that. I didn't ask this one, but, uh, and, but usually that begins the Google search for me. Like if, I, if it's something that I'm trying to think of, it doesn't, it, I don't take it verbatim. I plow it in there and then I start searching for it. And then there's a half an hour of me learning something very quickly. But you raise a really good um, point there because that was actually supposed to be the third part of my my triune is the research part of things, the customer research and mm -hmm. just your process of doing that helps you like refine, refine. So if it's if, it accelerates my Google searching by 10x, like right. chat GP, like having asking chat GPT the question I'm going to ask Google in plain text. I don't have to think about how I'm going to structure the search. I just go, I don't, what is this? What is this? What is this? And I might add a, ask a couple questions. And then I start add, I, I start grabbing onto the terms and it, it is literally 10 X faster now for me to Google after I've asked uh, chat GPT to start the conversation. And then I find all the things that chat GPT was wrong about. It doesn't matter because the names and the things that they gave me, it gave me were the things I searched against after that. And John? Yeah, if you also use the Bing chatbot tool, it will actually also surface uh, search results from Bing, which aren't quite as good as Google. But it's a really interesting, um, you see the description of the answer first, and then a, a series of actual sites that it references, which is really nice. Uh, but to answer this question, Stan, who's a member of our community and works in AI as his regular day job, posted an excellent answer to this question in our Discord channel of AI slash ML. And how long did it take for you to get access to Bing? Because I'm on a waiting list. It took just... me three days. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Next question. Next one comes to us from Tim O'Brien in Chicago. From an ethics perspective, do you feel the use of AI should be disclosed to anyone in the pipeline? For example, anything from a policy to simple code. Alex? I, I don't. I mean, we use a lot of crutches for, for a lot of things. This is another crutch, but I don't know if it's specifically different than than many of the other crutches people use, whether it's hiring it out to somebody else, uh, having it built somewhere, you know, using templates, grabbing onto things, cutting and pasting somebody else's contract. Like all these things get used all the time. I'm not sure if this is any better or worse than, than any of the other tools. Next question. Next one comes from Frozen Banwell in San Diego, California. Has anyone tried the summarizer with Brave Search? And he's got the link there. It seems like it could speed up some business-oriented search tasks. Alex? I haven't played with this one specifically. I will say that that summarization of processes is something that I find that ChatGPT does really well. You know, you throw something big in and go, give me a 10-point summary or give me this summary of this. And it breaks that when you give it data to start with, and then you have it just shorten it. Um, it does a pretty, pretty darn good job. It's I would say it goes from sixty percent accuracy to ninety ninety five percent accuracy pretty quickly of that summary. Next question, Paul Wallace, up again from Austin, Texas. Talk about some AI tools other than the ones we hear about all the time. Go ahead, John. I think a couple of really neat ones. Synthesia, which Liberty mentioned earlier, it's a way to give a transcript to a computer, and it will generate a talking head video. Um, it's not as good as having a person, but it works way, way faster. And you can quickly edit the video by just changing the script. Um, that will be used a lot in, I think, corporate training environments where you just need someone to have someone talking in front of people. Um, other training tools that we'll see is um, scenario building um, software, where basically based on a large data set like calls, volumes coming in, uh, you'll have artificial intelligences be able to call into a someone who's learning in a call center environment, and it will run them through a realistic scenario that's never the same call twice, just like a real phone call is never the same call twice. So I'm looking forward to seeing that um, really become, uh, become really popular in the training world. 
Alex? Yeah, plain language direction is going to be a big deal as this goes through. So you're going to say, I just need this, put this over here. I need this over here, put this, you know, and, and you start talking to it and you can kind of describe what you're trying to do, but not know how to describe it. I mean, right now, what people do really well is figure out how to, the nomenclature to use to get something out of a search or out of a thing. And you're going to get to a point where you can kind of describe oh, it's a little like a tree, but a little over the year. And I need to put this over here. And you're going to see a lot of tools that start to get really good at just following along with the user. Um, or like, for instance, you're going to see things that are, I, don't, I know these aren't the tools that are out there, but there's some fo folks thinking pretty hard about this is you take a bunch of pictures of your living room and say, I would like this to look like a Frank Lloyd Wright room, show me an image, and it will just give you an image, tell you where to find all the furniture, and boom, it's, you know, like, and it, and it follows all the rules of what that looks like. And and so you can say, I want, or I want this to look like this. There's, we, we built sets for people, digital sets for folks, where we said that the, the person who's going to be in the foreground said, I really like this architect. And so we found stuff from that architect and built a digital set that looked exactly like that architect, I mean, exactly like that architect would do. Um, and this is all going to be something you just ask for and you get 20 versions of it and you pick the one you like, or I want my kitchen to look like goth or, or I want my kitchen to look like a fr the French countryside, or I want that to look whatever. And it takes a look at what you have and then gives you something that looks like it. And those things are, I mean, literally less than two years away, maybe almost six months away. I'm being very conservative. And I'll add Otter AI that they've been around for a while. I've been using it for a while, but now specifically in our workflow, when we'll have a meeting and specifically saying certain things like, and this task, and just like having those key key words that will help once it's transcribed, that we'll be able to take that that snippet that whatever was said afterwards and know those are the action items. And then so the project manager will be able to take that and then put it into our system. So just, again, helping with workflow. I'm very workflow <laughs> oriented and helping to, to speed up the process as well. And then there are, I'm not sure if I hit enter on it yet, but there is durable, which is one that I'm testing out, it will help to write, build a website. It says 30 seconds, jury's still out there. So those two, in addition to um, what John shared earlier. Next question. Next one comes from Albi Lopez in San Antonio, Texas. Is anyone doing client commercial work with AI music? I know that Epidemic Sound handles the licenses online, but would there be any copyright strikes on AI music, like if someone claims the music at a later time? Alex? Chances are, I think, actually lower if you're doing AI stuff than it would be because you're not reproducing the same thing. The thing with Epidemic Sound that's really useful is that they pre-license it because it's one piece that might get used by a lot of people. If you're building something that's unique, you know, based on what you're handing it, it really has to, to match up most of those copyright strikes. It has to match the hash, not perfectly, but relatively closely. So if you make something too close to it, like anything else, it'll get picked up. Um, but if you're the first one on YouTube and you claim it and it has an original sound, the, most likely you're the claimant. <laughs> you know, that's going to happen there. And uh, and I think that we haven't talked about it much, but I think music and audio and, and those types of things are going to be dramatically impacted. It's not happened quite yet. Right now, what we have, what we see is is Google and other folks kind of generating the content from scratch and generating those sounds from scratch. But as it starts to generate MIDI from scratch and really dancing with that, and Apple's been doing some of that with their with their some of their stage products. Um, so it's it's already it's using machine learning machine learning to do that. But as we start to see that get much more creative, you're going to end up with. Um, I wouldn't want to be someone who did jingles, like I, you know, like that. There's certain things that that you look at. It's the market will get bigger over time, and we'll see more creative uses. But there's definitely people that'll be impacted. Stock photography and jingles specifically are, are businesses that I probably would not want to be in. I, or if, if I'm if I'm I'd want to be at the top two or three percent of the producers. But anything below 90, the top 90, you know, top 10 percent, anything below the top 10 percent of stock photography and and uh, jingle producers are probably going to have some issues, you know, as, as this moves forward. Next question. Eric Billings in Washington, D.C. is up next. Are there any panel members training their own artificial intelligence and or marine, uh, machine learning models? If so, have you noticed whether some file formats are more efficient for training, for example, doc versus text versus PDF or JPEG versus PNG versus SVG. Go ahead, John. 
Yeah, we're training <clears throat> we're training OpenAI with text files for one project, and we're training uh, stable diffusion uh, running on our own servers using JPEGs. Um, creating these models now is is it's kind of it kind of reminds me of of when the internet started to grow and and you had to have an internet strategy back in the day before everybody had websites you would go around asking people what their internet strategy is same thing's going to happen with ai there's going to be services now that are going to automate the process of you taking your institutional knowledge and creating a model out of it that data is the new gold next question Jesse Mills in the San Francisco Bay Area has one, looks like, for Chris. Excellent point, Chris. To follow up, what is the human touch that only can be produced with an organic mind and or real-life experience? This may be what keeps production crews in business into the future. Chris? Um, I would say two things. Delight and love. You, you want, if you want to kill the computers, as I do, uh, you got to do it with something that they don't understand. Uh, there's a great movie. I just watched it again last night. I've seen it several times. It's called The Adjustment Bureau. It's got Matt Damon in it. If you don't know the movie, see the movie. It's a great movie. And um, the short story, the short, the TLDR of the movie is um, Love Conquers All. And the love that David Norris has for Elise in this movie is befuddling to all the powers of the universe that are trying to break that tie. Um, but I, but with, when you can surprise somebody with something that's delightful, that they didn't see coming, and I think, and I think that that's what, and I try to avoid it but when i see stuff that's obviously ai generated it's like yep i expect that sentence next yep i expect that pa paragraph next yep i expect that adjective next it's it's expected but if you want to if you want to capture the imagination of the human spirit the soul of humanity you have to delight it you have to you have to surprise it um that's that's what I would say. But Adjustment Bureau. It's from like 2012. Great movie. It's one of my one of my favorite movies. Alex? There's a common thing in, inside of movies. I completely agree with Chris, by the way, is that is that the uh that there are many things where you get into there's this bigger sense of things that people keep on coming back to because that that you know that that they're looking for something that only can be solved that way and i do ag agree surprise and delight is, is a thing that comes up a lot that you want to find ways to do that i don't think that there is a problem I and mean, when it comes to events you know, ai is going to replace the perfunctory ones <laughs> you know, so the ones that are just like we have to do these events and we or we have to do this content it's going to take a long time to replace a human touch, a bespoke model, how people build things. On a lot of the events that I work on, you know, they cost a lot of money. <laughs> they, they take a lot of people. It take there is this fluid back and forth between people that matters. How the person talks to the person, how you talk to the host or the guest who's going to be talking. How do you prep them? How do you email them? How do you you know make them feel warm and you know ready to you know say what they're going to say? And I think we don't want to. Um, uh, under under you know a value that human touch that's there because it's, it's so much bigger than just the information i think that one of the things that I, I one of the most important interviews i've seen in probably the last 10 years was with rick rubin on 60 minutes if you haven't seen that you really want to watch it <laughs> like you know it's 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 up on youtube somewhere i think but i watched it and it it just he he doesn't care about he doesn't know any of the technical stuff what he pays attention to is he's looking for who that person is and figuring out ways to get that out of them into a record you know and and when he talks about it that way that's the kind of stuff that gets very very hard to do with a computer and will be hard for quite some time and when you think about you know the creative um when people do these great creative things um they're they have a, a very unique 50 years of history or 40 years of history that got them to this point that they've creatively pulled together and formed something that is that is dramatically uh, unique and interesting and and you know is something that delights people 
as, as Chris said. And I think that computers are going to take a long time to get there, but they're going to really handle managing lots of the little stuff around that <laughs> so that the, peop the people who are really good at it get can do that and the other stuff still gets done. And I think that that's where, but if you're the person that's in the other stuff still gets done uh, job, it's not where I'd want to be. You want to, then this is constantly why we have to keep on improving ourselves as craftspeople uh, to get better and better at what we do and really build great events because run of the mill events are going to be more and more automated. And Chris? Yeah, what Alex said about perfunctory is, is so right on. I mean, there's certain things that, are just going to happen and they're going to be what you kind of expect them to be. You know, earlier we were talking about, you know, the perfect chair and um, I can't remember who said it. I may have been Alexander who said, oh, I use this Ikea chair. And when you sit in an Ikea chair, uh, it's a chair. It it definitely fits the, the, uh, the, it has the check boxes. You know, it's like, it's got four legs. It doesn't fall over. I can probably lean back on it. It may hold me up. But um, it's just going to be a chair, right? It's just going to be a chair. My wife doesn't understand my uh, uh, fascinate or my my love of furniture. She's she's getting there. Um, the other a couple of weeks ago, we were at my mom's house, and my mom has an uh, uh, it's a Aero Serenin womb chair. It it's this chair, and my my wife sat in it, and she was like this is the best chair I've ever sat in in my life. And I said, this is why I care <laughs> because it's delightful. It's, it's beyond just the, the minimum definition of what a chair needs to be. It is a wonderful chair. And she, I covered her up with a blanket and she fell asleep in that chair. Anyway. anyway. Next question. Paul Terry Wallace in Austin, Texas, back again with what is the cost of copy.ai? Yes. Yeah, so I will pop the link in the chat, but as I mentioned, it was free. You can be on the free tier. tier. You, that's roughly 2000 words a month, I believe. And just think about that. You could probably get through that really quickly. So if you want to bump up and you find that it's useful, it's roughly $36 a month. And of course, anything more complex, you got to call their salespeople. Next question. Jesse Mills in the San Francisco Bay Area. Apps like MidJourney are fun and not that instructive on understanding how the theoretical math is fundamental to AI. So what about learning about data sorting, predictions, averaging as it relates to how we align our data within events and media? Alex? Yeah, there's just a lot of things that um, when you start to allow something to look at things over very large periods of time. So when you think about the, the kinds of things that AI is going to be good at as we move forward is analyzing, for instance, tons and tons of video of movement through an event space and then making suggestions about how to make that more efficient. <laughs> you know, like, you know, because it's going to look at all that analyzation. It's going to look at how long things took to do. It'll look at all those things. And we see some of that right now. But the problem right now is that we really have to, we have to keep pushing the data into it, like measurement, 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 where over time, AI is going to be able to just look at it and make the, and figure out what what's important and what matters. You know, there's a good example I, I, I love in Heathrow, they cut the the amount of time it takes to go through um, to go through the the, uh, the the security checks to get into the into the airport. They cut it the average time by thirty two minutes by adding one six foot one two meter table to the end of the thing when you're prepping your your bags. <laughs> they just they, you know and they they just experimented with one. And then they did that. That's not AI, but the point is, is that AI will start to see these little these little details of what this looks like at a mass level. That not that it's very hard for a human because we just don't have someone that can watch it all all at the same time and so fast, you know, and let it just sit there and churn on it. Um, and I think that we're going to see lots and lots of things that you know we look at. I do, you know, Makana is used for bigger events than what we do here every morning, and we had one event that we had over six thousand questions in twenty minutes. How do I go through those and find the questions that are that are like what I need, <laughs> you know, and and intelligently look at people with good and bad English asking lots and lots of questions and figuring out how to pull those in and grab the best ones and put them in. And those are the kind of things that that AI is going to help us with over time. It's not just machine learning. It's not just making decisions. It's intelligently looking at all of that language and then bringing it in and processing it. And our last question 
Morgan Price, Victoria, British Columbia, gets the nod. Everyone is so keen on AI right now. Where are you hesitant about using AI tools in your work today? John? Might be surprising, but I don't trust AI for basic math. Um, it summarizes most likely outcomes for next word, but it can't predict how many call center agents you need to handle a thousand calls in a 24 hour period. And Alex? Uh, accuracy. Yeah, that's that's the, uh, the most important one there. I think we have one more question. Next question. Uh, Joe Kidd in the Bay Area, California. How can I, how can AI mitigate natural resource scarcity? John? If you go watch any of the videos from Demis from DeepMind or Ilya from, from OpenAI, they're both in a race to, to create uh, artificial general intelligence. And Demis says, our quest is to solve AGI and then it figure everything out from there. And so, and, and Kurzweil says that's 2029. So once AGI is here, it's game over. It's going to figure out new materials that we could never figure it out. Any math equation, it's it's game over at that point. Awesome. Thank you so much, producers. Of course, this conversation this is not the last time we'll have this conversation, but thank you so much for your questions. Be sure to follow up in Discord as well so we can continue this. To our panelists, thank you so much for your insights. And of course, our production team, our back end team, for with, without which we would not be here. And tomorrow, coming up, we'll be talking about lower thirds for the second hour. And it looks like we have traveled 57,841 miles and 93,085 kilometers for, and that is 523 million bananas, 2.3 times around the earth. For scale. Yes. <laughs> so again, thank you. Join us in After Hours. And if you want to learn more about the rest of the week and what's coming up, head over to officehours.global. Bye. We, I wonder if there's some AI tool that would help close out the show. Maybe write a script. No, the light. It's the light. That's right. That's what Chris said. Chris said the light. Yes. How, co how come people don't just adjust this slider properly? <laughs> yeah, <it's accurate. laughs> you can say with five fingers and it actually works most of the time. I could say 12 fingers because base 12, but 13. I'm confused. Right. One of those samples, uh, Alex is gone. One of those samples that Alex put up just had like this random pencil just floating. Like, oh, ah, just might need a pencil. It's just literally just floating up here. Thanks, y'all.